Welcome to the San Gregorio Chapter uh, Trail Talk series. My name is John St. Clair, and I'm your Zoom host for tonight. And um, our topic tonight is touring the Eastern Sierra, and um, Julianne Anderson is going to be um, giving the talk, and I will introduce her. Uh, Julianne is the co-chair for the San Gregorio um, Outings Program, and she also is a member of the Trail Talk Committee that plans and, and uh, puts on these Zoom events once a month on the third, usually the third Wednesday, this time it's the fourth, and uh, she also is an outings leader, a hiking leader, so uh, I'm going to put the spotlight on Julianne and take it away. Oh, thank you, John. You're always so kind. John is, is an intrepid outings leader, one, one of our, our best and most experienced. So thank you so much for organizing uh, these, these Zoom meetings, John. It's just a lot of work and I really appreciate it. Um, good, good evening, everyone. So glad you could join us. Um, I want to talk uh, this evening about the Eastern Sierra. Uh, my spouse Maggie and I and our dog Mac and a couple of our friends uh, just last week were up in the Sierra and I took a bunch of pictures and I wanted to share uh, the places we visited with you and give you kind of a report of what's going on this year um, so that hopefully you can go up there this year um, and just... Um, on that point, I was just talking with uh, Christina Torres about our upcoming camping trips. We are doing two camping trips to the Owens Valley, Eastern Sierra. Um, and the, uh, um, the first one will be in August to the ancient Bristlecone Pine Forest, which is east of Big Pine and Bishop in the White Mountains overlooking the Eastern Sierra. We will be at a U.S. Forest Service camp called Grandview, about 16 miles east of Big Pine, and it overlooks the whole range of the Eastern Sierra. It's just a fantastic view and fantastic stargazing if we have clear weather at night. And then it's about 10 miles from the, uh, the ancient bristle cones. So we will spend some time uh, hiking the trail among the ancients. Um, Methuselah is the oldest tree in the world they the uh, forest service does not show where it is to protect it but we will be walking truly among the ancients california has the tallest trees the largest trees by volume and the oldest trees in the world all in our state um so i hope you can join us in the eastern sierra for that we're going to be seeing the largest trees at sequoia next month uh and then we'll be in the eastern sierra again in september at beautiful rock creek canyon at the french camp campground which is a delightful campground i uh, will be there in mid-september so many good things coming up now let's uh share screen and then i can show you some photos okay move on here Can everyone see that? No, we can't see it. Can't see it? <laughs> You're not seeing it? Can you see that? No? Hmm. That's not good. Do you have it open? Yeah, I do. Okay, let me back out of it. Hold on. It doesn't say that you're sharing the screen. Okay, I think I did it backwards. Technical glitch, everyone. You know what? Oh. Hang on, you guys. Okay, let me just back it out first. All right, here we go. Um. Okay. Okay. And hmm. oh, I'm so sorry, everyone. This isn't what I had hoped. 
Let me get this going. I usually get this a little smoother. Um, hang on. I think I put it up before and then I, I shared self. I shared self on you. Okay. Don't you resume? Yeah, there you go. Okay. There you okay, go. It's working. Got it's it. working now. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. All right. Let me get myself together here. Okay, let me get it going. Well, we lost it now. There we go. Now I can see it again. Don't hear anything yet. Okay. Can we see it now? Yes. And I can oh. hear you also. Okay. Sorry about that confusion. It just uh, the order of things. It didn't work out quite as as I'd hoped. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Eastern Sierra. And we were just there last week. Uh, this is a beautiful shot of the the mountains behind uh, Convict Lake, which is uh, a glacial lake and a natural uh, area just south of Mammoth the town of Mammoth. And as, as you can see, the, the beautiful lush uh, sage that's uh, part of the Great Basin. Just to kind of orient you to the Eastern Sierra, uh, it's sort of the confluence, almost like Joshua Tree, where two deserts come together. And then as you gain elevation, uh, we go through the oak woodlands, uh, uh, pinyon pine, juniper woodlands, and then Pine, pine woods and alpine settings as we proceed up the mountains. But the Mojave Desert proceeds all the way up to practically Bishop, where the elevation is such that the Great Basin uh, Sage Step uh, comes, comes down and becomes the dominant uh, flora. So this is uh, Convict Lake, which is, you know, rather high above uh, Bishop. You go up the Sherwin Grade and up 395 further. So this, this is about 7,000 feet, and you have this beautiful, lush Great Basin sage. And as, as you know, the Great, the Great Basin and the Mojave Deserts are two of America's four deserts, um, the other two being our own Colorado Desert, which is uh, Palm Springs, where I was just at earlier today, a lovely 106 degrees, 
and then uh, uh, the Chihuahuan Desert, which is in the Texas area. So we have up in the Eastern Sierra, the, the Mojave meeting the Great Basin. Um, so that's kind of orienting you as to the basic flora. Here are the basic updates uh, for late June, 2024. Um, we noticed high water, not as high as, as last year, which was just unbelievable, the runoff in June, but quite high. All the lakes are high. You'll see Crowley, uh, um, which is a LA Department of Water and Power Reservoir. You'll see um, uh, Convict is quite high. Uh, the June Lake Loop and Grant Lake, which is another uh, Los Angeles reservoir at the end of the June, June Lake Loop. And Mono Lake is quite high. So, um, and Mono, as we'll talk about further, is one of the Great Basin sort of terminal lakes, like the Great Salt Lake. You know, in the Great Basin, streams don't run to the ocean. They, they terminate in the desert. So Mono Lake is a saline lake, just like the Great Salt Lake is a, great, is a saline lake in that Great Basin. I mean, literally, it is a desert basin. Um, and the pioneers, you know, as they were coming west after 1849, they, they came across it and they complained about these little paltry western rivers that disappeared into the sand. Well, that's just the nature of it. This isn't the Missouri. This isn't the Mississippi. These are little rivers that disappear into the sand. And that that is the nature of our western deserts and, and the Great Basin in particular. So high water, it was quite warm. Uh, reservations were require, are required now for Yosemite. They have returned. Um, as you recall, uh, several years ago, they, they required reservations. And now because crowds have been so great, um, the National Park Service has wisely, in my view, uh, returned the reservations. So uh, there we are. And uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful trip last week. Just stunning weather. Okay, Highway 395 um, in the Eastern Sierra areas that we visited. Um, we're gonna highlight Coso Junction, Manzanar, Independence, Big Pine and the ancient Bristlecone uh, Pine Forest. Um, it, we went to the, the information area only. We'll talk about the actual pine forest uh, in more depth later. Bishop, uh, Rock Creek, beautiful Rock Creek Canyon, Convict Lake, Town of Mammoth, and the Mammoth Lakes above, the June Lake Loop, the Mono Craters, the youngest volcanoes in North America, and the Mono Lake Scenic Area. Here is a brief, uh, a well-loved uh, exhibit. Uh, you will find at the, uh, the two state rest areas that are prominent in, in the Eastern Sierra. There are the Coso Junction uh, rest area, and the Division Creek rest area. Coso Junction is the first one. It's south of Olancha. It's north of Inukern. Um, very significant both for its the area, both for its volcanic activity, and as we will discuss, uh, the Indian history, the Native American history there, and and our own California Trail of Tears that came out of that area with the Owens Valley Paiute, and when the ranchers came into the area and fought with them and displaced them in 1863 in the middle of our civil war. So Coso Junction is very significant in my view and, and helpful. Here you can see, if you see my arrow, this is three, Highway 395. The highway itself is very significant. Uh, it's part of the good roads movement early in the 20th century. As you may know, um, after 1900 or so, when Model T's and other cars began mass production, people were out and about motoring on, on the highways and they found little more than wagon roads throughout America, very poor roads. And both the bicycling craze of the 1890s, you know, bicycle built for two, that, that kind of craze, and then the automobiles that came right around 1898, 1900, uh, you know, uh, Henry Ford had his quadricycle, I think, in 1895 out of Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, by, by 1900, 1910, there were Model Ts uh, on production in, in America. So this good roads, good roads, quote unquote, movement uh, caught fire across the whole country 
I remember my my grand my late grandmother lived in Iowa, and she was so proud to be on the Lincoln Highway, which was the first interstate highway. It was um, roughly uh, where I eighty is now, but it um, it went right past their farm and town, and uh, it was part of this movement to build good roads, and it was completed right around nineteen twenty. Well, around nineteen ten, uh, the counties of Inyo and Mono here in the Eastern Sierra formed a good roads club and they were lobbying the state of California for, for highway funds because the, the, the state passed a big bond issue, a, a really big one, right around 1900. And Inyo Mono, uh, at that time, before Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power did its thing, which we will talk about, this was a very uh, prosperous agrarian area, ranching, farming, very lush. Owens Lake was a real lake. Um, so they wanted to build roads and they, they wanted people to come see the beauty of the area. Um, and eventually they did get road funds and they did get uh, the highway built. And it was called the El Camino Sierra. Um, the El Camino Sierra. And then later, uh, just Highway 395 is what stuck. That's the name that really stuck. And the first real portion that was built is that really steep portion north of Bishop known as Sherwin grade, which is, you know, about five, eight miles of 10% grade. It's very great. It's very steep. That was the first part of the El Camino Sierra to be built in the 1920s. And then the rest built out around it. Um, so, uh, and, and gradually the area was built and then Tioga Pass was a little more than a one lane dirt track until about 1960. It was just, they call it uh, terrifying Tioga, but that area built out afterward. But but this is the, the heart of the Owens Valley and the Eastern Sierra's Highway 395. And from us here in the inland, it swings uh, kind of down here around Inyo Kern and Ridgecrest, and then over to um, uh, the Rand uh, uh, mining area, and then back to Kramer Junction by Edwards Air Force Base and Highway 58, and then Atalanto and, and San Bernardino, uh, the, the Victor Valley, and then down down the 15 to San Bernardino. So 395, as you know, gets picked up in Hesperia and then just moves moves north and then swings a little bit to the west and then moves north through the eastern Sierra. Um, so that's the basic highway history. The the flora, as I mentioned, is the Mojave Desert down here because uh, it's the lower area and that clear up through, you know, about Big Pine, then it starts to be mixed and then it becomes Great Basin as we climb elevation to, to Bishop. And then that's the, that's about 5,000 feet or so. And that becomes Great Basin Step, the Great Basin Sage Step. Um, like the steppes of Central Asia, it's, they call it the Sage Step, and it's much lusher, more crowded, um, uh, wetter sage, and that's the high, the high sage of the Great Basin, you know, which is from here in the Eastern Sierra, and then over northern Nevada into Utah and the Salt Lake area, and then up into Wyoming. This whole area is the Great Basin, and it comes clear into Eastern California, starting at about Tahoe and Reno South. So that's that's kind of the flora. Um, as we mentioned, there's also human history here. Um, many, many years, of course, of uh, Owens Valley Paiute here in, in the Owens Valley area, and then the Shoshone here further north around Bishop and parts north. Um, and we should remember our California history um, starting probably around the gold rush. As you remember, uh, gold was discovered in uh, the Western Sierra by John Marshall at Coloma uh, in 18, January, 1848. By late 1848, the fall of 1848, President Polk at that time uh, announced the, the gold strike in Congress. And after that, a mad rush ensued and everyone poured into California in 1849. Just imagine there were so many people in California in 1849, we didn't even have to be a territory. We became a state almost immediately by 1850. So a year and a half after the gold was discovered, a year after it was announced by President James K. Polk, 
California was a state in 1850. So all these people are, are rushing into the Western Sierra over here, displacing Native Americans there, taking, you know, after the initial gold rush boom kind of abated, people settled down and started farming. They started plowing up and developing the Central Valley. So all those Native Americans started flowing over the Sierra Crest into the Eastern Sierra. And so, of course, there was communication and conflict as one group was coming into the territory of another group. But those Western Native Americans were telling the Eastern tribes what was happening, that they were being displaced like radically fast and their land was being taken and plowed under and developed radically fast. So by the 18, early 1860s, uh, people had been settling up and grabbing land in the Central Valley. Then they came into the Owens Valley. They started ranching in the Owens Valley, uh, which at that time was incredibly flat, uh, lush and, and because of the Owens Lake was, was still a lake at that time. And uh, the, the Indians were um, not too happy with it, as you could imagine. And conflict ensued. Promises were made by the American government, not kept, that they would get, the Indians would get supplies and whatnot. The Indians stole cattle. Uh, Indians were killed. Then settlers were killed. The cavalry came into the area, middle of the Civil War back east. They sent the U.S. cavalry into California to, to deal with this situation. And uh, what happened was really uh, a trail of tears. And we will talk about that in just a, a, a few minutes, but something that's not taught in, in schools in uh, uh, California very well. And I never knew about it until I saw, and this is where I'm coming from, the very, very excellent exhibits at Coso Junction rest area here. And then at Division Creek, which is the, the northerly uh, state rest stop where, where the tribes have told their story through public exhibits. Um, so I will read those to you in just a minute. So that's a little bit of the human history in part. Um, we should know at the same time just about the water history was going to radically change in this area. Uh, just a few years after the human history, the, the Native Americans were, uh, as we will see, marched out of the area in 1863. By the 1890s, just 30 years later, William Mulholland, who was uh, the chief engineer for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, was camping up in the, in the Tuolumne Meadows area of Yosemite and dropped down by horseback into the Eastern Sierra and realized there was this massive water resource in the Eastern Sierra and the Owens Valley. And he hatched a plan to build a great aqueduct, bringing water from the Owens Valley into Los Angeles. And uh, and he began designing an aqueduct that would be gravity driven, completely a huge pipe. And then it would, it would be, um, and then in connection with canals and small lakes, would bring the money, the, the, the water into the San Fernando Valley and into Los Angeles. Um, so how they did it was they, it was surreptitious. It was rather devious. They sent agents who were, be, pretended to be ranchers who bought up acres and acres and acres of land in the Owens Valley and the water rights beneath it. So the city of Los Angeles owns a huge portion of the Eastern Sierra and the Owens Valley. There, people joke about the fact that it, it would be a national park, except it practically is because Los Angeles owns all the land and they're going to keep it the way it is to keep their water rights. So uh the aqueduct was finished in 19 or the first phase of it was finished in 1913 it was added on to in the 20s and in the 40s uh where they proceeded north they built a reservoir at grant lake at the edge of the the june lake loop which which dammed rush creek which is the feeding source of mono lake so starting in the 1940s mono lake was being choked off and decimated by the 70s uh it's and it's one of the main breeding areas for California seagulls. 
um, and uh, is a source of brine shrimp. It was the primary brine shrimp or protein source for the Native Americans that lived in the area besides small game and deer. But brine, the, the, the tiny flies and shrimp at the area were a protein source. Um, and the, the lake was dropping radically uh, by the 1970s and it threatened to dry up. So the Mono Lake Committee formed and uh, won some significant court cases and the public trust doctrine was developed under law, under, under water law. And it was a hugely significant legal principle where the public, uh, the city of Los Angeles, namely, has to respect uh, that, that, that this is a public trust. This is a resource held in public trust. It's not just to be drained and used by one particular municipality. Um, and so the beginning of, of law around the water, uh, the water draining from Mono was, was started. And at now, uh, Mono Lake is back up to almost uh, its, its near normal level. Um, and uh, it is far healthier than it was 50 years ago. Um, so that's the water for Los Angeles. There, there was a huge fight in the 20s. There were bombing campaigns. Uh, where residents and ranchers in, in the Owens Valley would bomb the aqueduct and tear it up. And, and so there was just this huge struggle over it. But in the end, uh, the ranchers understood that they weren't going to have that water. And some of them sold out. Others turned to making the area into a tourist economy. And that's what it is today. In the meantime, uh, the dry lake became a health hazard. It became a dust bowl. And even now there have been further court cases about the Owens Lake as well as Mona Lake. And um, the courts have ruled in favor of the Owens Valley and have ordered the city of Los Angeles, which is my employer. I work for the city and I am a, a city attorney for them uh, in the criminal side. Uh, they have been ordered to mitigate some of that dust bowling. So you go past the Owens the Owens Lake, and it's actually a lake again. Uh, there is water in it, especially in a wet year like this, and certainly last year, which was even wetter. Uh, the lake is again a lake, and they there are little berms, and there are all kinds of plantings and things that the city was forced to do so that you don't have this blowing dust bowl of toxic dust. So uh, that's the status of the lake, and it's it's a very important history to the area, to us in Los Angeles, and enabled us to become the second largest city in the nation, but it decimated this valley. It's no longer the lush, verdant valley that it once was 100 years ago. Um, uh, so very poignant and bittersweet. Cozo Junction is further north, and this is um, the area of the Kozo volcanic field. We should note that the entire Eastern Sierra is hugely active volcanically. Uh, the area around Kozo Junction is a basalt uh, lava field. You'll, you'll start driving up and you'll notice this black lava, these lava fields. They look like they, they were deposited yesterday, but they um, were about 10 to 40,000 years ago. Um, it's obsidian. The obsidian was used by the Native Americans to fashion tools, arrowheads, and the like. But it's this dark soil, this dark black soil. And what we're seeing here in this photo is, is a cone. It's a cinder cone. And you'll notice they're all around you. Now, further north, by, by Bishop and Mammoth and Bridgeport, that whole area is part of the Long Valley Caldera. It's a caldera, a super volcano, just like Yellowstone. And Mammoth is hugely volcanic. There are hot springs all along the area. Um, the Mono Craters and Inyo Craters are the youngest volcanoes in North America. They're, they blew 400 years ago. And this pumice, not the obsidian, not, not this black basalt, but pink frothy pumice formed a 500-foot layer of what they call Bishop Tuff. T-U-F-F, Tuff. And you'll notice as you go through Bishop and then up the Sherwin grade, you'll see these pinkish cliffs as you drive up the Sherwin grade. That's the Bishop Tuff. That's this pumice that has been in place for hundreds of years now. But that is, is a different kind of volcanism than the, what you see to the south, which is the older basalt obsidian uh, black lava. 
but all of it super uh, volcanic, um, lots of hot springs behind the Mammoth Airport, not far from Convict Lake is the, the Mammoth Hot Springs there. Um, excellent fishing. The fish love all the insect like and all the all the, the heat in the, in the stream, but you can go down and sit in the hot springs. You have to be actually careful because you could scald yourself. It's so hot. But uh, parts of Mammoth Lakes are so so sort of vulcanized there's there are co2 emissions that have killed off the forest at the northerly part of the mammoth lakes which i think is lake george it, it there's this dead forest and it's not a forest fire it's from the volcanic gases so lots of volcanism kind of starting at at, at Kozo junction as you can see here now here is the owens valley paiute exhibit and i want to read part of this to you because it's important for us to hear what happened um here i'm going to read it we the numu pronounced noom which is our word for people known now as the owens valley paiute all right thank you are native to the, to the broad and beautiful valleys here what you see may look stark and dry but long before the whites came we understood this land of one of abundance and season by season we worked hard to harvest this gift gifts this land was given to us by our creator this land has and will ever remain our home how we lived moved with the seasons we ate pine nuts game grass roots seeds fish and insects we made our bows from the tall straight juniper one tree sometimes lasting for many years we chipped out fine arrowheads from nearby obsidian we wore blankets in winter made from softest softest rabbit fur we built tonies that's the name of their dwellings from the tall straight willows, tulies, birch, and grass. This was our shelter. We wove beautiful willow baskets in which to gather grass seeds, roots, and pine nuts. And we fashioned exquisite cradle boards and we pillowed our babies' heads with down feathers. Cultures clash. When the whites first passed through this land, we watched as they fattened their cattle on our finest meadows. They drove away the game, built cabins and fences on the best land, and offered us no tribute. Our lifestyle was disrupted and we were hungry all the time. When our brothers from across the mountains came and told tales of destruction brought on by the white people, we were filled with fear for our own country. Our, then trouble began. How easily one thing led to another. Some hungry Numu killed a stray cow, the whites killed a Numu, then the Numu killed a white. Everyone was angry and afraid and there was fighting all the time. The whites wanted us to sign a treaty in exchange for food and supplies. Some of the headmen who wanted peace agreed and signed, but we were given nothing. So the trouble got worse. One night we drove off 200 head of cattle, but they retaliated and killed four Numu. It was war. One spring, 1862, many Numu gathered around and attacked the settlers to drive them out of our valley forever. Uh, there were nearly a uh, uh, hundred of us. The military came in, and yet we drove them all out. 4,000 cattle, the settlers, and the military. Our peace didn't last long. That summer, the military came and built Fort Independence. And that is still at Independence today. It's now the site of the Owens Paiute Reservation. Uh, but then it was a fort. Um, and by the way, at the time, independence was the Union bastion and Lone Pine was the Confederate bastion. They, they named the Alabama Hills after the ironclad ship Alabama. The Union's uh, people dwelling near independence named Kearsarge Pass after the Kearsarge, which was the Union ironclad, which defeated the Alabama. Anyway, they built Fort Independence. They destroyed our caches everywhere. That fall, we were when we were finally gathered for independence to sign another treaty. Um, they promised them food and clothing. No supplies ever came. They were as hungry as ever, so we left the camp, went to the mountains. They were growing weaker, and finally, uh, uh, the soldiers had ordered a shoot on sight and have show no mercy to to these people. Old ways die. Finally, in the heat of the summer, so imagine it's this time of year in the Mojave Desert. It's in the 90s. Just hold that in your mind. We surrendered. In a year and a half of fighting, over, over 200 Numu were killed. The whites yet again proposed peace and promised food and supplies at Fort Independence. Almost a thousand Numu came and turned in weapons. Then we were told we would be moved the next day. This is the heat of the summer. They didn't tell us where we were going or how far it was, 225 miles away. We had never heard of Fort Tejon, nor did we realize we were marching us and they were marching us out of our beloved valley forever. So they marched those those Native Americans, those Indian people, through the Mojave Desert, this time of year, the heat of the summer in the 90s, through the Mojave 
to the Tehachapi's. That's that's the grapevine. That's Fort Tejon. That's the top of I-5 there as it drops down into the Central Valley. 200 miles away, they walked them. The march to the reservation near Fort Tejon brought suffering and heartbreak. With nothing to eat or drink, they herded us like cattle, drove us day and night, first through the desert, then through the mountains. There were only a few wagons to hold the sick and elderly. Everyone else walked. Our young girls were violated by the soldiers. Mothers too weak to carry their children were forced to abandon them praying that someone might rescue them. Many of us died, and no one cared to count how many. A few managed to escape under cover of darkness. Of the 998 Numu, only 850 arrived at the reservation. The March of 1863 ended our way of life. Those of us who escaped, evaded the soldiers, or returned ended up working on white ranches. Years later, when the city of Los Angeles bought up land for water rights, the Numu were displaced once again until small parceled reservations were established. Today, we, the Numu, still live in this beautiful place, and our lives encompass two worlds. We struggle to maintain our identity in the modern world. Part of that challenge is to remember the, the old ways, teach our children, and remember the story that changed our lives forever. I wanted you to hear all that because I had never heard that in school. I went to LA Unified Schools. No one ever taught me this. We had a trail of tears right here in 1863, not that long ago, uh, in Eastern California where people were rounded up and marched off their land. So I think it's really important for us to know this and to, to talk about it and, and to bear it in mind in terms of our state's history. I mean, they were talking about what happened in the, the Central Valley. You know, we, we changed the name of the Hastings Law School because Hastings, you know, there are people that were putting out bounties for Native Americans. They were seeking scalps of Native Americans. Hastings did that. He had a bounty for scalps of people. Um, so just incredible atrocities. Well, this was the one in the Eastern Sierra closer to us. This was the, the forced march of 1863 of the Owens Valley Paiute. And it's important for us to know that history. Other deep and, and tragic history that it's important for us to know um, is Mandanar. My mother was in high school in Los Angeles. It, she was class of 1945. So she started high school in 1942 at Belmont High School, high school in LA. And she remembered her friends who were Japanese American being, you know, they had, they, they left school. And she remember one young man just hanging his head as he walked out because didn't know what was going to happen. And it just, heartbreaking and this is what happened they people were rounded up in places like downtown los angeles the building where they were collected is still there it's right next to the japanese american museum it's it's on first street it's like two blocks from my office in riverside it was at the corner of um market and first um what was a parking lot i think it's now a a, a hotel uh, our congressman, Mark DeCano, his parents were taken uh, to the camps uh, and they told stories of uh, from from Riverside and they told stories of the ladies of the Congregational Church passing out coffee to people um, as they were being loaded onto trucks and they took them to um, Santa Anita to the race course to, to and they put them in the horse stalls and then they, they were there for a while and they put them on trains and trucks and put them to, into the 10 camps of, of the West. And one of them was Manvinar in California. The other was Tule Lake. And then there were eight others throughout the West. And then there was one in Arkansas. Um, but this is in the Eastern Sierra. It's under Mount Whitney. It's starkly beautiful, but very cold and windswept. Uh, ironically, there's an Inland Empire connection. Um, the Chafee brothers, who George and William, who built the city of Ontario as a model colony and the city of Etiwanda, um, and the city of Upland. All this was part of that model colony movement in the 1880s. Well, around the turn of the century, they went up to the Eastern Sierra and they were going to build other another model colony area around Manzanar. They had apple orchards there. Uh, but when LA started buying up the water rights, they realized they weren't going to have the water and they sold the city of LA. And then I think the city then sold it to the federal government for this camp. Uh, it was called Manzanar for the Spanish word for apple. Uh, but uh, that's kind of the story of how the land uh, came into possession of this camp. Here's the historic site. Uh, it was in disarray for many years until the 90s, and it was made a, a national, basically a national monument. There's a visitor center and, and 
wonderful historic ex exhibits talking about this. And then they built up a block of the uh, the barracks. This this tower is rebuilt and and uh, placed there in approximately where where it was during during the war. Um, this is one of the barracks. Uh, just bear in mind, there were about 20 of these barracks buildings and they're large. They're just tar paper. You can see cracks. I mean, I'm sure they were really cold and windy to live in. Each block, and there were like, I think, 40 of these blocks. Each block had about 20 of these buildings and had uh, men's latrine, women's latrine, a rec hall, and a mess, a mess hall, and I think a rec hall. And then they had 20 of these blocks. So that was just... I think it was 10,000 people. It was many, many, many buildings. And now they're primarily um, just foundations. But they threw these up in 1942. They, just, they threw them together. And people were then brought here and expected to live here. There's the cemetery under Mount Whitney. Uh, very, very poignant. Um, if you get there too late for the exhibit or you're there in the middle of the week when when the museum is closed uh there's an auto tour you can take uh, which you can drive around the the former camp and it's it's very educational and this is the official entrance these these sentries uh sentry stations they built them with sort of a folk pagoda roof and the masonry to make them kind of permanent now on a happier note um independence Independence, as I mentioned, was the site of Fort Independence, where, not such a happy note, where the soldiers were based uh, to displace the, the Native Americans, the Owens Valley Paiute. After the town was, was more greatly established, um, it became the county seat of Inyo County. And there's a courthouse there, that, that kind of 1900, early 1900 style of courthouse. It's, it's like the Riverside Courthouse. It looks very similar. Um, but there was a woman named Mary Austin who's very interesting and in her home, and this is the plaque, is a, a California State Historic Landmark. Um, she was a feminist, a school teacher, a self-taught naturalist, and she wrote a book called The Land of Little Rain. And it is a beautiful, lyrical book about the Mojave and about the Eastern Sierra. Uh, really worth reading and listening to I, I i've got it on tape or you know audio uh, for my commute to and from work but her home is about two blocks um west of of uh, highway 395 and there's a it's a state historic landmark so it's worth the visit also in independence is the eastern sierra museum uh, which has exhibits about about the uh, the area and the culture Next, further up in Big Pine is the Big Pine Ancient Bristlecone Pine Forest scenic area. As I mentioned, that's going to be our third camping trip of the summer in, in August. It's a rather high camping trip of up at 9,000 feet, so I want to do it in August when it's hot down below. It'll be very nice up there. Uh, but this is, a, this is an ancient uh, uh, pine forest, as I mentioned, the oldest trees on Earth. And they are protected in the Inyo National Forest by, um, by the scenic area. Here's the uh, um, the marker for the turnoff there. It's Highway 168. It's right there in Big Pine off of uh, uh, Highway 395. And this is the marker, uh, Ancient Briscoe Pine Forest. Um, and that's what they look like. They're, they're, they look like um, junipers or pinyon pines. Very, very gnarled. You can see why they would live thousands of years. Bishop, uh, the town of Bishop, it is the largest uh, city. Uh, actually, it's even larger than Mammoth. Um, it's the largest city in the area. And uh, um, Schatz Bakery is the must-stop place. Uh, so if you're coming or going, you've got to get some of their wonderful uh, bread. And it has been there since the 30s. Bishop is the site of the hub of ranching in the area. And it sits at the foot of the Sherwin grave, it, grade in that, that Bishop Tuff, that, that thick layer of volcanic pumice. But um, uh, as I said, the biggest town, I, I think it's a, over 10,000 now uh, in Inyo County. 
Now, as you, you summit the, the grade uh, on 395, you start getting into um, Pines and Alpine area. It, beautiful Rock Creek Canyon is, is off of what's called Tom's Place, right at the top of the Sherwin Summit. Thomas, Tom's Place is about a 100-year-old resort, but as you proceed up Rock Creek Canyon into the, into the mountains, there's a string of about six um, beautiful Forest Service camps. And the, the first one is French Camp, which we are going to camp at in September. Uh, beautiful junipers, pinion pine. Um, it's lower, so it's less buggy, less mosquito-y. Uh, but as you proceed up the canyon, the canyon is just lush and gorgeous, full of aspen and cedar and pine. Uh, and here's beautiful Rock Creek Lake and Maggie and Mac. Maggie, my spouse, Mac, our dog. We we had lunch there at from the Rock Creek Resort, which is another 100-year-old resort. It used to be known as Pie in the Sky because they were known for their pies. Well, I, I'm pleased to report that whoever runs their cafe really knows what they're doing. Their food is excellent, although expensive. You know, a bacon cheeseburger there, and it's really good. They smoke their own meats. It's like 16 bucks, but it's the food is excellent. Best fisherman's sourdough sandwich I've ever eaten is from that place. You can get there open early. Uh, again, they have their, they, they smoke their own meat. They have their own smokehouse on site. So definitely worth a stop at the Rock Creek canyon resort and then take your lunch or your breakfast over and at this beautiful crystalline lake rock creek lake further up uh is the famous and enormously popular mosquito flats and it's enormously popular because it is the highest paved roadhead trailhead in california you can take that rock creek road up to ten thousand feet uh, no other trailhead is, is at 10,000 feet where you could just drive on a road, a paved road to get there. You don't have to hike up there. You can just get there, park and go into the wilderness. And so it, if you don't get there by 730 in the morning, there's no parking there. And there's a substantial parking lot there of about 30 spaces, but they'll all be taken up and you'll start seeing cars parking along the road leading to it. So it's a tremendous area, but there are, it, it, here's Rock Creek, uh, Rock Creek itself. So it's, it's full of the beautiful um, Rock Creek, which flows down from the Mosquito uh, Flats area through the canyon, just lovely um, and green and lush. Uh, and here's the resort that was known as Pie in the Sky and now has the excellent food, uh, Rock Creek Lakes Resort. So well worth a stop. Well, you know, support them. Their food is really excellent. Um, here is an alternate hiking area, Hilton Creek's trailhead. Um, it's uh, equally equally lush, a little more difficult than the Mosquito Flats area because it's it's got elevation gain and loss. Uh, Mosquito Flats really is uh, flat and marshy up into a series of small lakes up there. But uh, Hilton Creek is an alternative. Convict Lake, where we stayed, we had a very nice cabin with some friends who had never been to the Eastern Sierra. So we, we cabined it and it was, and here is, is uh, the beautiful mountains behind Mount Morrison, behind Convict Lake. Uh, and you can see the, the different kinds of geology here. The red, I think it's a metamorphic rock, which is uh, uh, worn away to the harder granite beneath. And the, the, this is the canyon with the, uh, the water flow into the glacial lake. And, and this was a glacier and the moraine would be kind of where, where I'm sitting, I mean, was pushed out toward Highway 395, and you could see all these features as you drive into the Convict Lake area. Known as Convict Lake for a real Wild West situation, um, prisoners broke out of the prison at Virginia City, Nevada, rode across, rode west across uh, the, uh, the the Nevada and the Great Basin area to what is now 395, killed an itinerant. Uh, uh, postman, you know, the post, the post, the postal workers always get it. These, these convicts killed him. And so a posse formed from Bishop, they came up and they hunted down these convicts and there was a shootout at Convict Lake and some of the posse were killed and some of the convicts were killed and they caught them all and they, they hanged them. Uh, so it's a real wild west story of, of violence in the 1870s in this area. Uh, but Convict Lake itself is beautiful, um, fairly good fishing, a gorgeous um, lake, uh, very nice resort, very nice 
forest service uh, camping area, clean as can be, um, highly recommend. We love it. And there is a, a walking uh, path around the entire lake. Part of it is paved and AB ADA compliant. A convict has become very much a, a wedding venue as well as a fishing, very popular fishing place. And they have what they call the roundup of the lake in the fall and the spring where they have uh, contests for the biggest trout. So uh, lots of activity and fun things to do at convict, lots of weddings. Um, lots of people come up there. So the cabins are ADA compliant um, and you'll see part of the pathway is as well for all the folks that, you know, all generations that come up and are, are enjoying these weddings. So a lovely place to be. There's the fishing beach where uh, our friend wanted to learn how to, how to fish. And so we set up, didn't, we got skunked, got skunked, but uh, not, doesn't really matter. The view was just beautiful. Um, uh, so just a lovely view. And that's the view out of the cabin. Um, and uh, almost it looked almost like stained glass. It was so pretty. This is this is again Mount Morrison and the surrounding mountains. This this metam metamorphic rock, and uh, the the beautiful lush Great Basin sage through these windows of this cabin. More fishing. Uh, this this whole family came down from the San Fernando Valley in L.A. and they always have an annual camping trip. So they come over camp at the Convict Lake campground and they all fish and it was just really fun being near them. Smell they they broke out the, the easy up the, the bacon and uh boy the whole place smelled like bacon at 6 30 in the morning. So it was good. And here's Maggie and Mac. And our, our friend is out of view but we she made us beautiful breakfast burritos that, that morning we were trying to fish. We got there early enough but the fish just weren't biting what we had. And here's the trail. Here's convict like as I was mentioning. Um, the creek comes down here, feeds uh, the lake here in the uh, westerly portion. There's a beautiful, here's the marina, the campground's kind of over here, the resort's kind of over here, um, and there's a path that goes all the way around it, which is a beautiful walk, although very exposed over here. And here's a view south from our cabin, lovely. Town of Mammoth Lakes, uh, Mammoth and the Mammoth Lakes. As you know, Mammoth was uh, um, has been known for its skiing, and it was developed after the war. The guy that developed it got a job as uh, a Nordic ski, um, kind of an itinerant tester of snowpack for L.A. Department of Water Power. And so he knew where all the good snow was, and he determined that the north slope of uh Mammoth Mountain had the best snow, and he started uh, building rope toes and getting engines that were from uh, Army Surplus, and he got some Army Surplus kind of amphibious tractors. They looked almost like tanks, and they would tow people up <coughs> the snowy slopes. So that was the beginning of Mammoth in about 1950, and it just went from there. And I think I think the guy's still living that that started it. I think he's very very senior. But he supported businesses. He got he supported the Cerro Gordo Community College with scholarships. Um, so a real force for developing the town of Mammoth, of Mammoth. The Mammoth Lakes are the Forest Service camps and in, in lakes and the Forest Service camps surrounding them above and to the north of the town of Mammoth. And the lakes are beautiful. As you can see, this is the campground. We picnic there. There's Lake Mary, you can see it here. Um, just a lovely campground, and I think we'll be going there next year. Um, and uh, just, this was a more exposed space that we just sort of picnic day use, but uh, right on the lake, and the lake is just lovely and full. The June Lake Loop, boy, prettiest loop in the whole Eastern Sierra, just alpine and gorgeous. This is a view of very beautiful June Lake coming in uh, from the highway from 395 it's just lovely and this is the water is very powerful coming out of out of the uh, the higher reaches and that you can see this waterfall is just gushing and there's a whole series of little Edison power plants that they built 100 years ago in the 20s and before and and they're still operating they went up there and they they harnessed the power uh, from the the hydroelectric there Here's the Mono Craters north of June Lake. Uh, as you, you come out of the June Lake loop and you proceed 
back toward 395. These are the youngest volcanoes in North America. And as I mentioned earlier, they erupted 400 years ago. So very recently, and you can see all the pumice, that the cones are formed of this, this gray pumice. And there are one, two, three cones here in this picture. And there's a fourth lower cone kind of over here uh, to the north of these and to our left in the picture toward Mona Lake, right off of Mona Lake. And as you can see from, from the marker here, um, this whole area was part of an ancient lake and Mono is the remnant of that lake, um, kind of this, this great basin lake. And it was all pumice, as we mentioned. So uh, you could see this as you, as you approach 395. And here's the Mono Lake scenic area. This is beautiful, um, the beautiful tufas uh, from, uh, this photo is taken from our fearless leader, Marianne Reese. And uh, uh, I, I hope that she's here with us and can talk a little bit about the, um, I'm not sure if she's here tonight, I don't see her. Talk a little bit about the Mono Lake uh, bird Chautauqua. And uh, Marianne, if you're here, feel free to chime in. But this whole scenic area, is it's like the Bristlecone Pines. It's its part of the Inyo National Forest and it's uh, a scenic area, it's specially protected. Um, so the tufas are a buildup of calcium carbonate from the saline lake. And this is the primary area where California seagulls nest. I mean, who would, who would have thought that, you know, seagulls, which are at the beach, Will come this far inland to, to nest, but they do, and there are, there are uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of seagulls that come here to, to nest throughout the season. Um, so there are a lot of bird bird life here, um, besides the 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 uh, seagulls, and uh, the whole area has a beautiful visitor center. And and just just as we were going home on Thursday, Marianne was coming in Thursday for the bird Chautauqua, which is. Uh, typically the weekend, I think after after solstice, so uh, uh, that's when it's typically held, and it's at the visitor center, and they do all kinds of uh, lectures. So, so anyway, that is uh, the end of my discussion here, and uh, that's where we ended our. That's the farthest north that we got. Um, so it was a wonderful trip. And uh, just beautiful weather, and we had a fabulous time. So let me see if I can end the screen share here. There we go. Um, well, I seem to be having problems with this. But anyway, um, John, if you can hear me, I've uh, I, I finished my uh, yeah. program. Uh, does anyone have any questions? And feel free either to put it in the chat or to just speak up. There was one question in chat, in, in chat from Kathy Cole. It says, does Rock Creek run through the Toya Bee National Forest? I've driven through that area and it's beautiful. You know, I'm not sure if if it originates in Tyobi or not. Um, I'm not sure of the headwaters of Rock Creek. That's a great question. I'd have to research that, but it's high up uh, in that whole um, Mosquito Flats area, and it flows down the canyon past beautiful Little Rock Creek Lake and all the way down, and I think it terminates into Crowley. I think it flows into, which is that the big, the huge reservoir that DWP built, and you know, that's where there's opening day for fishing season. Yeah, I suspect it does not, because most of Toyabee National Forest is in Nevada, it does encompass part of Eastern California, but I'm not sure it comes all the way over to Crowley. Over the crest. Yeah, it would have to be over the crest. Um, yeah. But we just had the most fabulous time, everyone. Uh, I highly recommend getting over there sometime this year. If not with our uh, two uh, camping trips, then, uh, then, then on your own. I see that Joan Taylor has raised her hand. What's going on, Joan? Oh, yeah. Um, I was interested in that you're uh, leading a trip to the White Mountains because yeah. <clears throat> on August 17th and 18th, the um, Desert, California Nevada Desert Committee will be having their meeting at one of those camps up there. I don't know whether it's Grandview or another. When is your trip? Uh, let's see. 
I think it's a little before that. Boy, that's good to know. Holy smoke. Because it's first come, first served, you know. Yeah, and they usually take a little, uh, maybe a hike the day before on Friday. It's usually a, you know, Saturday afternoon, Sunday thing. So there's it's, uh, often the... earlier. It's August uh, 5th, 6th, and 7th. So it's Monday. Oh, Tuesday, okay. Tuesday, yeah. Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. Just wondered. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's uh, there's going to be a gathering up there on the 17th, 18th that people are interested in, probably Friday night, the 16th, too. Right. Okay. Um <clears throat> If uh, so, maybe that people will want to go up there twice because Grandview is is just a, a beautiful area to look out over the Sierra, and then the stargazing at night is just lovely. It's dark skies. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to get um the, the announcement to uh, Marianne to share with chapter for those who are interested. Yeah, the White Mountains are gorgeous, and, and there's certain aficionados of the the Inyos that feel that the best views of the Sierra are from the <laughs> yes <laughs> looking the back at it from the east. I mean, it's fabulous yeah. looking. Yeah, it really is. So well, thank Thanks you for, for that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Pro great program. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Um, uh, you know, for, for what it's worth, my just lay knowledge, but it's such a fascinating area in so many ways. And I feel like we've just begun to to scratch the surface. Yeah. Um, and I, I just, there's one thing I would say though, when you, you mentioned that the Mono Creek is almost returned to quote normal, that it's returned, almost returned to the adjudicated level that okay. was a compromise. Yes. Yes, that's thank yeah. you. It's not normal. Mm -hmm. It's that's the court's mandate. Yes, yeah, it's the minimum. Right. It's almost back to the minimum viable. Yeah, and I I, I saw they actually had that at the um at the visitor center. It's just a few feet below the what what the court has mandated. So yes, that's absolutely correct. And the normal level was higher than what the court has mandated, but it's better than it was in the seventies. So at least there's some progress. Yeah, and it's viable, and I think a compromise is being worked out with DWP to, you know, restrict, since it was, it was such a bumper year last year, to actually hold back some water to keep it up, keep well, keep flowing it till it reaches that level that it's almost at. Uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of our prior mayor Garcetti, but one thing he did do that was right was um, stick by the city's word to to mitigate uh, the Owens Lake and to not take. Um, I think the full allotment, I think Mayor Bass has done the same thing. They're not taking the full allotment, um, which is good for the city is, is not being a hog. Um, but, uh, and, and that being said, uh, you know, the, the, the lake, Owens Lake is just a vestige of what it was, but there is water in there. So at least it's not a dust bowl, but, um, beautiful and fascinating area. Um, I, I will say, and, and some folks are, have been interested in this, uh, the September trip to French, French camp, because it's situated in kind of a central location, it's not that far up the canyon, we can do a lot of different activities. Some people have expressed a desire to go up to Bodie, the state historic park, um, which has the, you know, a, a beautifully um, presented uh, history of basically industrial mining. Um, when you when you think about what happened to the West after the Civil War, there was this explosion of people moving west to extract. They were going up to to Montana for the copper mining. They were grabbing, you know, getting land for farming, for farming and ranching all through the West. They were mining. They were coming to California for first the gold mining and then and then industrial gold mining. In Bodie, I mean, this is the kind of place where they were going back to Wall Street and seeking investors. They were, if you haven't been there, you need to go. Huge buildings that were, you know, this isn't just a, a miner with a pan. This is like huge buildings to, to work um, with these industrial stampers to work the ore from dozens and dozens of of mine shafts throughout that Bowie area. They had ten thousand people there at one point in the eighteen eighties, and they're living in these wooden shacks slash homes. Um, it, it fell, um, they, they played it out probably by, about by 1900, 1910, it burned down pretty much by 1930. So, um, what the states have, have done, the state parks have done is they call it arrested decay. They put roofs on things. They didn't rebuild the buildings, but there are some still standing. There's an excellent, excellent museum there. Their docents are top notch. They've got a great bookshop. I mean, just if you go there and see the park and, and it, the ruins are extensive, the streets are still standing. Many of the buildings are still standing. So it gives you a whole look of 
industrial mining in the West from about 1880 to 1930. And uh, just an important history. I mean, just picture it. They, they were wondering why they had such a huge, just a high infant and toddler mortality rate. They had cyanide pouring down the streets in a, in a water slurry of cyanide. They used it to, to process the ore. Uh, and it was just killing people. I mean, they had this toxic, toxic chemical in, in their, you know, makes you wonder about walking around to this day. Uh, but uh, I mean, that's the kind of thing that was going on there. Just industrialized mining um, in the 1870s and 80s. So well worth, so that's going to be our, one of our um, big jaunts in September. Um, I hope to uh, do some hike. We're going to have four days, three nights of so two full days of hiking. I hope to do some hiking up at Mosquito Flats or in Rock Creek Canyon because it's so pretty. Um, possible hike up to Fern Lake in June in the June Lake Loop area and possible uh, uh, jaunt up the Tioga Pass to uh, Tuolumne Meadows. Tuolumne is, is partially rebuilt. Um, we will require reservations, so I'll see if we can get them for September. Uh, last year, 70% of the ranger quarters had been destroyed from there's snow beginning up there. Uh, and the, the visitor center was destroyed. The backcountry center was destroyed. The campground and the cafeteria and the gift store and all that was destroyed. I mean, it was just cataclysmic up there. I think they've since rebuilt the visitor center and the backcountry center. I don't know about the poor rangers. They had the, the, the young man that saw us at the, the kiosk last year was living out of his car up there. It was just pathetic. Um, so they had just a lot of damage to infrastructure up in Tuolumne. So this year, I think they're getting a little bit back on their feet and we'll see in September where they're at uh, if we if we get up there. So stuff to know. Um, so we'll have two full days to kind of explore around in the from the beautiful French camp uh, campground. So um, and don't forget also uh, end of summer. I want to put in a plug for our Joshua Tree group camp. We snagged the site at the Sheep Pass uh, group campsite, campground. So the sites accommodate 30 people. So we can have a lot of us. So, if, you know, grab your tent, throw it in your car. That's going to be in October from, let's see, October 7th through 9th. So three days, two nights. Uh, so one full day of hiking. It'll be, it, it'll be fun and, and I think nice weather early October. So anyhow, all, um, if there are no other questions, um, I've been talking your ear off uh, and it, it's been just a pleasure to share what we saw last week. Um, and I hope you guys all get up to the Eastern Sierra. I think it's just one of the jewels of California. Just so gorgeous. Um, so have a great night um, and, and go to the Eastern Sierra. Good night. Thank you.